Well, good morning, students. Uh, we're really glad to have you here with us at the Rock Pile Museum. Um, we've actually got several devices we'll be talking to you from, so we may have to switch those as we go. Um, so we're going to start out here in the schoolhouse. And we're going to give you a little tour of the museum. We will be moving through the museum so that you can see the exhibits and and uh, we'll spotlight a few of our exhibits, including the school house. So with me today is Stephen Zacharias. He's one of our museum educators. And Stephen uh, is going to talk about the school house while I go inside. I hope you've all visited the museum before, and I'm sorry that you can't visit today, but I'm glad you're here with us virtually. Uh, and I hope you can come again real soon because we've got some great exhibits. The first thing I wanted to talk about is today is actually a special day. It's International Museums Day. This is a day that museums across the world and communities across the world celebrate museums and the role they play in our communities, in our society, and what they do for us as people. And so I want you to think a little bit today as we're touring, uh, what do you think why do you think museums are important? That's a question that I'd like all the students to think about. Uh, right now, I want to introduce you to Stephen. Stephen uh, is going to talk about the schoolhouse. As I said, he has been with the museum over a year, and he is a living historian and cultural interpretive specialist. And that is fancy words for he makes history fun. And uh, he really does. He's been a pleasure to have here at the museum. And I really hope that sometime soon we can get his programs going again and get you back here to see him. So let me turn you over to Stephen. Uh, I am Stephen Zacharias, the museum educator here, and welcome to our Oriva Schoolhouse, the one room schoolhouse. And we use this schoolhouse to give you an experience of what going to school would be like in the 1890s. Now, um, think about when your school year starts. Usually, late August, early September is when we go to school now, and then we attend school all the way to May or June, straight through. But in the 1890s, that wasn't the case. In the 1890s, we only went to school for six months out of the year. And don't get too excited. We didn't go straight six months. We went three months in the wintertime and three months in the summertime. That way, you could work around harvest and planting schedules needed to be available for helping mom and dad around the farm. So uh, everybody from three to four years old, all the way up to eighth grade. That's right, you only went to eighth grade, then you took the oral eighth grade graduation exam, and you went on your way. Your school day was a full day. Usually you have to walk to wherever the schoolhouse is usually a central location in your community, uh, and so you walk to school, bring your pail lunch with you. The three and four year old would sit in the front row, the first graders in the next row, the second graders in the next row, third, fourth, and then the eighth graders would usually stay in the back. The teacher would only work with you one row at a time. You have about a half hour or 45 minute block where you work on arithmetic, you work on handwriting, uh, oratory recitation was very popular using books like the Holy Bible or William Shakespeare. Your teacher would read to you line by line, and you'd have to repeat it back to that teacher uh, as you went along. Uh, there was occasional time to do chores and to do recess. Uh, it was your responsibility to keep the coal going in the coal fire, so somebody would be sent out with the scuttle bucket there on the floor, and you would go and collect the coal, and then come back, and we would still fire to keep the classroom warm in the wintertime. In the summertime, we'd open up all the windows and the doors so we could get a breeze going through here because uh, it would get really, really hot. Now, one thing a lot of people want to know is what happens when you misbehave? Uh, there's all kinds of punishments the teacher could do. Uh, for the boys, oftentimes you misbehave, you get to come to the front of the class and you put your arms out. And then the teacher would take a stack of books and you would Pile those books up on your arms, and you have to hold it there for 45 minutes to sometimes put an hour. Uh, another popular punishment is we would take the chalkboard here and we draw a big circle on it, and you'd have to put your nose in the center of that circle. Sometimes you can stand in on your tippy toes to put your nose in that circle, and again, 30 minutes to 45 minutes would be your punishment. Now, uh, like I said, you 
only got to go to eighth grade when you had to come to the front of the room and be tested. It could be anywhere from an hour to two hours long. And the teacher would have a series of questions about U.S. history, arithmetic, grammar, um, many different questions that they could pull from, and then you would have to answer. You had to get 80% of the questions right in order to graduate, and then you were done with school, and you went on about your life. One of my favorite questions is arithmetic question, and so maybe you want to write it down, see if you can figure it out later. You have a wagon. That wagon is 10 feet long. It's two feet deep and it's three feet wide. How many bushels do you fit in that wagon? Now you can Google it all you want, you won't find the correct answer. Why? Because most people don't know exactly how big was a bushel. But a kid in the 1890s, especially a rural American kid who works on a farm, they were putting wheat and other grains into bushels all harvest long. So they would know exactly what the diameter and what the height of a bushel was and how many would fit in that wagon. It's one of those arithmetic questions that gets lost over time as we make uh, progression. Which is why we exist at the Campbell County Rock Pile Museum is so that we can try and prevent other things from getting lost to time. We try to preserve and conserve our collections uh, for the Powder River Basin uh, so that people like you, your families, your, your friends, you can come in and you can see those things from the past and understand uh, how they worked, how they helped people uh, at, at that time, and then advanced to today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Robert now, and he's going to take you through the main museum, and I'll see you in a little while at our homestead chat. I'm inside the main museum building. Our mission here at the museum is very simple. We tell the story and stories of the Powder River Basin. And those stories are everywhere from dinosaurs to the modern energy industries and everything in between. And so we're in the Kent's room at the museum. And I'll turn around here. Some of the stories we tell are um, everything from geology <coughs> to paleontology. <coughs> So you'll come to the museum, you're going to see some fossils. Right here we have some um, sea fossils from when this area was underwater. And hopefully you've learned about that, but this whole area used to be part of the Great Interior Seaway, or the Western Interior Seaway. And so that's why one of the big reasons our geology is the way it is. It's one of the reasons our, our coal is here, our oil and gas, and so that story is important for us to tell because it uh, really impacts our life today. We also have uh, fossils from early mammals uh, like the saber-toothed tiger, bison, um, short-faced bear skull is over here. That's a short-faced bear. These were from um, the Eocene era and the Pleistocene. And then we come around here, of course, uh, you guys know about dinosaurs, right? We do have some dinosaurs in the Powder River Basin. Right here, we've got some pieces of a Triceratops. Um, these are all Triceratops fossils uh, found in the northern part of the Powder River Basin uh, across the line in Montana. So we talked a little bit about that. Here's another great fossil. This is a uh, Tylosaurus paddle. Uh, the Tylosaurus was a huge creature, huge sea creature. Uh, up to 30 feet or more long. Um, so this paddle is actually just the little, little tiny flipper on this creature. And it's, you know, three feet long or more. And that gives you some idea of the size. We also talk about the early inhabitants of the region. Of course, when we're talking about the early inhabitants, we're talking about Native Americans. Um, and even before the historic tribes that you would know, the Crow and the Northern Cheyenne, the Arapaho uh, and the Sioux tribes, there were peoples here as far back as 10,000 years ago. And typically what we find are archaeological sites that tell us about those early peoples. And one of the things that is, helps us kind of date those sites are spear points or projectile points. So we've got a, a wonderful display of projectiles. And we also have um, a hearth, which was one of their cooking 
um, sites. So this was an oven right there in the center bottom that uh, has been excavated from down along um, in the Thunder Basin grasslands area. And as you can see over here, quite a lot of stone tools. Hopefully you'll come and check those out someday. Also a great rifle collection. Um, you may have, well, we may have some hunters in the call today. Um, mostly these are um, weapons that were either um, used in the military or of course for hunting and, and subsistence so people could hunt their own food. So there's a lot to see in this front room. Uh, even more rifles. I believe we've got about 100 on display at any one time. Uh, all different types of makes and models. Uh, and then on the far wall, we've got some lamps, uh, spurs, bits, uh, and some, some other cowboy equipment. All right. Let's walk through this way. You know, we also tell the stories of individual people and how they lived. Uh, one of the things that, uh, of course, is really fascinating people is how people used to live. So how they, what they used to wear, how, what their fashion was. Uh, there's Miss Bessie Bell Gupton at her store on Gillette Avenue. Uh, she sold uh, women's hats and accessories. We've got a doctor's exhibit over here. It tells a little history of the early doctors of Gillette. Music. Music is one thing we all love, right? So how did people enjoy music? Uh, what were the devices they used? So we've got uh, an old phonograph machine, an Edison phonograph, uh, an old radio, records, um, a four-track system. You may have heard of an eight-track. Ask your teachers. Maybe they have. They're probably too young as well. Um, so some neat things there. And then again, some fashion. This is one of our newer exhibits. Uh, with lots of hats and these hats that were connected to women from our community and a little bit about their history so a fun fun display we'll come around this way and i understand you wanted to learn a little bit about mr edward gillette so i will let me pull in for a stop here Switch my camera back. This guy right here, oh, I'm doing the telestrator thing. Right here, that's Mr. Edward Gillette. Um, that is a sculpture of him uh, created by a local artist. Edward Gillette was actually from the East Coast. He went to school at Yale and learned engineering. And uh, the reason he's connected to our community is that he was uh, the main railroad surveyor that located the railroad line through here. He was hired to do that in 1884 by uh, the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad. And at that time, they were still in eastern Nebraska. So he located and surveyed the line through the sand hills of western Nebraska into South Dakota and then eventually to Newcastle, Wyoming. And about, the, about 1887, they started to survey this area. And at that time, there was really only ranches here. Ranches, lots of cattle, wildlife. Um, lots of grass, and so they wanted to get that railroad here to take those cattle out and get them to market. So they, they located a line along Donkey Creek, and then when Edward Gillette came back in 1890, he wanted to make sure that was the best route. So he came back through himself with his survey party uh, and found a different route along Stonepile Creek, which is right here below the rock pile. The rock pile and the stone pile are the same thing. So he found um, a shorter route, so it saved them lots of track. It saved him many bridges, uh, up to 30 bridges that they didn't have to construct. And uh, typically, um, they were honored for doing that kind of great job. And when he was in Newcastle, his crew and himself got a big raise because they were doing such a good job. So they expected to get a raise again, but instead of a raise, uh, they got a town named after him. So that's how Gillette became uh, the city of Gillette. So Edward Gillette ended up living in Sheridan. 
He never resided in the city he, that was named after him. Uh, but he went on to, again, survey railroads that went from uh, Toluca, Montana, down to Cody, Wyoming. He also did some surveying in Alaska in the <clears throat> early 1900s. And he was also the Wyoming state treasurer. So he has a lot of history here in Wyoming. And um, I think we should all be proud to have our, our community named after him. He was definitely one of our, our early pioneers and very important to this state. So that's Edward Gillette. I've got a few more pictures of him. Um, there's Mr. Edward Gillette when he was a little bit younger. I believe this photo is taken in Western Wyoming when he was working on that Cody line. This is probably the famous one you've seen of him with his granddaughter, Virginia. And that's what the sculpture is modeled after this picture. But I also have some pretty rarely seen photos of their survey crews. So when I'm talking about railroad surveying, this is what they were doing. They would be on horseback and tents, and they'd be out on their own, a small party that would be using instruments to locate the railroad. So here's Edward Gillette's survey crew. Quite a life to be a railroad surveyor at that time. So we'll uh, hopefully have some time to take questions at the end. So if you have some questions about Edward Gillette, please, please let us know. All right, let's swing back around. Did want to take you through this section. We've got um, quite a few veterans exhibits. This is a new one that Stephen actually did about the Medal of Honor and um, the soldiers that were connected to Wyoming that have won the Medal of Honor. So hopefully you can get in here and check that out. We've got uniforms, wheel around. Um, all of these uniforms are from World War II. Uh, from Max Warlow in the Marines and Ole Carlson, who was in the Navy. And then some World War I history. Mr. Mr. W. O. Dunlap, that's his uniform and equipment there. Around the corner, we find a business exhibit. Some neat artifacts in this business exhibit, including that cash register right there, which is brand new to us. You're the first visitors to get to see this. It is uh, from a store on Gillette Avenue called B.H. McCarthy Clothing. It came to Gillette in 1920, so it turns 100 years old this year. It was later part of the J.C. Penney store and then Nelson's Clothing, and the Nelson family uh, has put it has loaned it to us, and hopefully they will donate um, very soon. So come check that out. It's a beautiful cash register. Now we'll go around to the back room. And of course, one of our favorite artifacts is the sheep herders wagon or sheep wagon. And there's Grace. You guys see Grace? She's the museum mascot. Uh, she keeps us in line. But the sheep herders wagon is, uh, it's like a Wyoming icon. It is, uh, was developed in Wyoming. And the gentleman who made this particular wagon, his name was Frank George. Frank George was a uh, blacksmith and wagon maker, uh, originally from Wisconsin, and came out to Wyoming very early in 1877. He uh, settled in the area uh, around Fort Fetterman, where his family had ranches, and then he worked as a wagon maker for the military at the fort, uh, and really honed his skills there. He really became a good wagon maker. Uh, he learned for, <coughs> excuse me, he learned from a um, I believe it was a Swedish blacksmith and a Norwegian wagon maker. Eventually, he moved into the town of Douglas, which is near Fort Fetterman, uh, when the railroad arrived there and opened his own wagon shop. Him and his partner uh, are often credited with creating the first sheep wagon in Wyoming. Uh, there's some debate there uh, because there's some folks in Rollins that made a sheep wagon early as well. Uh, I'm not sure we'll ever know, but I think we're going to give him credit today because we have his wagon. Um, so he's one of the first folks to make a sheep wagon. And it's going to be difficult to see. But right here on the side, I think you can probably make that out. This says, made by Frank George Gillette, Wyoming. So he later moved to Gillette. 
and he worked in a wagon shop of his own here from 1923 to 1930. So that's when this wagon was made. And it's, it's in pretty incredible condition. It um, is owned by the Daly family. And the reason it's in such good shape, we believe, is that the Daly's uh, quit raising sheep around 1936. So not long after this wagon was made, it wasn't needed anymore. So it went inside a barn and it was preserved for many years. Let me take you inside. See if I can do this. There's the inside of the wagon. So the sheep wagon was the herder's home away from home. The herder would spend the majority of the year in the sheep wagon, and that was necessary to look over the flock. Um, it's, it's a little different than raising cattle. Uh, cattle can pretty much survive, um, except for some extreme weather. They can survive out on the range all right by themselves. Uh, they do have some predators, but sheep are different. Sheep have a lot of predators out there, and so the herder was necessary to make sure um, they were protected. So the herder lived in here, of course, uh, the bed in the back, the stove up here in the front for cooking and heating, um, and everything the herder needed he would have here and be resupplied by his uh, flock master or someone else at, at the ranch. So uh, Stephen will talk a little bit more about sheep raising and sheep ranching, but that's the sheep wagon for now. All right. Kind of a fun little wagon alongside it is called a sleeper wagon. There's the sleeper wagon. Uh, this was developed by local ranchers um, that would want somewhere to sleep with the um, sheep, with the flock during the summertime. And this would get them out of the tents and off the ground and protect them from snakes. Uh, and it was able to be pulled by one horse, so it's a little bit more mobile than the large sheep wagon. Because during the summertime, the, the, the flocks of sheep tend to, to roam a lot farther, graze. Um, they don't come back to the same bed every night, necessarily. So um, this could be used on the ranches in Camden County. So we've got a lot of different exhibits in here. This one over here is about oil and gas and coal mining. And some great information there, some interesting coal mining videos. Uh, you can learn more about that. You can see we've got our chairs spaced out for social distancing uh, when we reopen. Around the corner is a great collection of saddles, saddles and tools of the cowboy. So the cowboy, uh, very important in this region. Uh, the men and uh, that took care of, uh, of the herds, round up the cattle uh, when they needed rounded up, did the branding, of course. Um, very similar to ranching today, but really a lot more mobile. Uh, the saddle was probably their most important tool. If you didn't have a good saddle, you'd be pretty, pretty sore. We had some saddle makers in Gillette, so we've got some history about those saddle makers. We've got a branding exhibit. Talks about branding and shows branding irons. And then ranching history on down the line here. Don't have a lot of time to go into detail today. So again, I hope you come out at some point soon and, and check these exhibits out. I wanna make sure and give Stephen plenty of time out at the homestead shack. One final area. Oh, there's the wildlife. A nice collection of, uh, of mounted wildlife. One final exhibit I wanted to give you a sneak peek of is, is this exhibit that will open uh, very soon. Uh, this is about women in World War II. So it's a temporary exhibit that our staff has created. And it highlights both the local women that served in World War II and teaches you about the women's branches of the service. So you'll learn about um, U.S. Army nurses, uh, WAX, which is uh, women's auxiliary, and WAVES, which is the Navy auxiliary, the U.S. Marine Corps, uh, women's reserve, and SPARS, which is the Coast Guard 
Woodman's Reserve. So a lot of great history here. Again, you're the first to see this. So you're getting quite a tour today. We've got uniforms and stories and pictures and um, it's, uh, we're excited for people to see it because it was supposed to be open uh, right before we closed due to the uh, coronavirus. So it's uh, gonna be open any day now. But that's the museum. Uh, Steven is out in our annex building and he's going to tell you about our uh, homesteader shack. Stephen. Well, uh, welcome back. I am out here at our homestead shack. Uh, this homestead shack was built in the winter time of 1921 and then into the springtime of 1922. So it's about 99 years old. We'll celebrate its 100th uh, birthday next year. Uh, this homestead shack was built by a man by the name of U.S. Staley Archibald. And Mr. Archibald was actually the first Eagle Scout to ever live in Wyoming. Uh, he came here after the end of World War I. Um, Mr. Staley uh, served in a medical unit in France during World War I. And during that time that he was serving our country, his family moved to the Casper region of Wyoming. He was really excited as he wrote home to his father that he looked forward to finally being able to live out west like his father had promised him since he was a little boy. Uh, he came out here because you could lay claim to land. And if you built a homestead on it and proved up on it for four years, it was yours. He didn't have to purchase it or buy it. Uh, so he came out here and he thought it was a good place for a young buck to start because when he wasn't working on his homestead in the winter times, he could work in the oil fields. And so he would go uh, work the oil fields and he did everything from electricity work to uh, working on oil rigs to driving trucks. He would do whatever he could to make some money in the winter time and in the springtime go back to ranching. There was just one small problem. He had to, in order to prove up on the land, he had to take 80 acres and grow crops. But out here there's one big problem. We don't have a whole bunch of lakes and rivers with lots of water in them. So how was he gonna get those crops to grow? We had to take advantage of all the snowfall and all the rain that come. And it used a process called dry land farming. So you really relied heavily on your plows. His plows were pulled by horse teams. Uh, he got really lucky because that winter of 1922, all of his neighbors experienced, like him, a very, very bad winter storm out here. Lots of livestock, cattle and sheep ended up dying because it got so cold and they didn't have access to food. Some of them froze to death. Well, Mr. Staley, he didn't have a whole lot of sheep. He had a borrowed team of horses. He didn't have any cattle yet. So his horses survived the winter, he survived the winter, and his tar paper shack survived that winter. He was able to grow some corn uh, and be able to prove up on his land, but it took him five years instead of four. Uh, it took a little bit longer to prove up on his land. His, uh, this shack is built on the southern end of Campbell County, almost across the county line, down in an area known as Pine Tree. Uh, if you travel down uh, Highway 59 till it ends and you come to the intersection, uh, just on the other side of the intersection is a little one-room schoolhouse. It's the Pine Tree Schoolhouse or Pine Tree Community Hall. They used to hold dances there in the evening, and in the daytime, a lady by the name of Miss Pearl, she taught school in that schoolhouse, and it was only about three or four miles from Mr. Staley's shack. He said she was a really good dancer, she caught his eye, and they ran away to Broadus, Montana and got married in secret. Although there was one small problem. Miss Pearl wrote a letter to her friend that told her all about her wedding and how they eloped so that she could keep her job as a school teacher. Because if you're a school teacher, you can't be married and teach kids. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, you can't be married and teach school kids. They don't want that. So she wrote a letter to her friend telling all about her wedding. Then she wrote a letter to her school superintendent telling him what her plans for the next school year was going to be. 
The only problem was Miss Pearl put those letters in the wrong envelopes. So the superintendent got the letter that was meant for her friend, and her friend got the superintendent's letter. Well, the superintendent, he forgave Miss Pearl, let her finish out her teaching contract, so she got to teach for two more years. But when she got married, she told Mr. Staley she was not living in this shack. So she took her teacher's salary and she went and bought one of those sheep wagons like you just saw in the museum with Robert. And for the first two years of their marriage, Mr. Staley and his wife, Miss Pearl, lived in a sheep wagon. Eventually they were able to save up and buy a proper house and they then turned this into a one-room schoolhouse that was used to teach their boys. They had two boys, Charles and William, went to third through sixth grade in this one-room uh, schoolhouse that had previously been Mr. Staley's home. And then when they finished school, uh, it got turned into a bunkhouse for ranch hands because Mr. Staley became very famous for raising sheep in Campbell County, his prized pine tree Columbias. Uh, Columbias was a, sheep, a type of sheep that first was developed at the University of Wyoming and then they got officially named and set up in, uh, in southern Idaho uh, at the Sheep uh, Research Center there. Uh, the Columbia Sheep uh, was a sheep that Mr. Staley was very proud of, and he spent over 30 years here in Wyoming uh, winning awards at every state fair that he could. He became part of the registered uh, Columbia Sheep Breeders Association, and even today we get lots of folks from that association that will pass through Gillette, They'll come out here, they'll read the sign on the shack about Mr. Staley, and they'll go, hey, wait, did you know he started our association? And we say, yes, yes, we did know that. Uh, we're pretty pretty proud of that, that family. Um, his sons eventually turned to Red Angus, and they went to beef at the end of Mr. Staley's life. His father had an exceptional green, hand, uh, green thumb, and he built an amazing orchard down there in Pine Tree, on the Archibald Ranch. Uh, if you ever saw a sheep that had an A, a lazy A with a long S on its rib cage, you knew that that was Mr. Archibald, uh, Mr. Staley Archibald's sheep. Uh, that's how he identified them. The Angus, uh, the Red Angus that his son ran, they had a tree as their brand. So if you saw that tree on the on the uh, shoulder of a cow, you knew that was from the Pine Tree Ranch as well. Uh, we really hope that you guys enjoyed your time uh, exploring the uh, museum today. We do hope that while we're closed, uh, go to the rockpilemuseum.com and we have lots of activities. We have a couple of virtual exhibits that no longer exist physically, but they are online. Turn up your sound, go around and explore. It's kind of like a video game, it's a little first person adventure where you can go through the exhibits that way. We do have some STEM learning activities in our learning lab area. And then every Thursday night, we release a new jigsaw puzzle where we take a photo from our collection and we turn it into a jigsaw puzzle for you. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Robert now for the last couple of minutes here. All right, guys, I hope you had a good time. Uh, questions today? How did um, they get to teach their kids in that chat? If they were married, they couldn't teach kids. Was it? Well, uh, Miss Pearl, being a former school teacher, she took over the education of her children. So you would refer to her as a homeschool teacher at that point. She was no longer teaching for Campbell County School District. She had to teach her boys on her own. So it didn't really count that she was married. Uh, no, it didn't because she was homeschooled and no longer working for the school district. So she didn't get paid to teach anymore. Uh, it's when you're paid to teach, you have to follow the rules. Okay. Good question, Dylan. Um, so, in the beginning with the schoolhouse, is that what, where, like, the one other field trip we had would be? Um, yep, and I'm really sorry that you couldn't come and do that in person, but um, maybe we can figure something out next school year to have multiple grades come and participate in our Pioneer School program. That is the school you would be in. You would come in as an 1890s era student and participate in 
a partial school day in that schoolhouse. It's called the Oriva Schoolhouse. Good question. I have a question. Um, where is the original location of that schoolhouse? Is that the original location or is it moved from somewhere else in Campbell County or Gillette? Yeah, it's moved from Oriva. So Oriva is up the railroad to the west. So if you kind of drive out a cheetah road, that's the direction you're, you want to go to find the, the, it's really just a railroad station of Oriva. There was never really um, a town, uh, but the surrounding ranches and families uh, would have been part of the Oriva community. And so the students that lived in uh, those ranches, those homesteads in that area, went to school at the Oriva school. Yeah. About the uh, sheep wagon, did the sheep just stay outside of there? The sheep stay outside. Yep, the sheep were outside all the time. The herder moved his wagon where he needed to move along uh, to take care of the sheep. Uh, sometimes a little later on, uh, when it was time for shearing the wool, they would have a, a farm for, them, for a house. Uh, it's uh, a shearing shed of, of sorts and so they would move them back to a main ranch and shear there and then they'd sand them back out to, to keep eating that grass great question so um you know when we went back in the other room where we talked about where like there was the bed and the stove and then like a little counter in one of the wagons um the one next to that does that like would the sheep stay inside of that or no typically just the herder is going to be inside the wagon there Ooh. would okay. or maybe a, a lamb was sick or maybe it was a bum lamb um that they could keep warm inside the wagon but uh for the most part it was uh the shepherd and his probably his dogs or one of his dogs his favorite dog and of course, his horses were there outside as well. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. I have a they can survive a winter out in the Powder River Basin pretty well. Um, their biggest challenge, of course, back then, they had old large coyotes, uh, large predator birds or raptors like golden eagles, um, and uh, thieves. Bees, and they also don't forget crows. Crows, crows like to eat lambs. So uh, lambing season, you gotta watch out for crows. Why didn't Why didn't she teach her kids kindergarten, first grade, and second grade? Because uh, at that time, her kids were still going to the pine tree school up the road. It hadn't uh, stopped operating yet. So by the time they got to third grade, the Campbell County no longer ran it as a schoolhouse. It was just a community hall and a ballot location for even on voting day. Your family could go and gather on that southern end of Campbell County to vote. Uh, but by, by the time her boys were in third grade, there was no local school for them to attend. There was at one point in the late 20s or the 30s, I think over 130 rural schools in Campbell County. So every little group of, of families had their own school. And that's because transportation wasn't, wasn't as great as it is now. We, they weren't able to bus the kids all over the county. So the kids often would either walk to school or ride a horse. Um, but typically, I think most of them walked. And so the schools couldn't be that far away from where the families were living. So that's why there were so many schools. Um, I, I'm asking this for one of my students because she has a bad connection. Um, so first of all, Gillette, what is the man's first name that was named after Gillette? What was his first Ed name? Edward. Okay. And who is, what is um, Campbell County named after? Is that a person? It's like the last name of Campbell? Yes, uh, the first territorial governor of Wyoming, his name was John A. Campbell. And he, it was named after him. 
And depending on what you're reading, some people also say that they named it after um, Robert, Campbell. Robert Campbell, who was um, a, a fur trader, pioneer, early explorer. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that's been added on over time, but that's that's how history works. We uh, we look back in time and, and we get to decide how to interpret that history. So um, Robert Campbell and John Campbell. And Campbell County is newer than Gillette. Uh, Campbell County wasn't uh, formed until, or passed into law until 1911. Gillette was founded in 1891, so a full 20 years earlier. Uh, so Gillette used to be part of Crook County, uh, where Sundance is. And then they formed Campbell County out of the western halves of Crook and Weston County in 1911, and then it organized officially in 1913. Dylan? Is there really a difference between a normal wagon and a sheep wagon? Oh, certainly. Yeah, there's a lot of differences. Uh, a normal wagon or a Conestoga wagon, prairie schooner, whatever you want to call it, that is typically used for hauling goods. Uh, you want a lot of space where you can throw stuff in and take as much as your oxen team or your horse or mule team can pull. Um, a sheep wagon is designed specifically for you to live in. It's a place where you can sleep at night, you can eat all your meals, you can cook, uh, you can relax. Uh, so you're not using a whole lot of storage. They had to get creative. Uh, the Basque people, who were the typical sheep herders in the um, Australian outback and eventually in the American West, uh, they came from a region in Spain and France known as the Basque region. Uh, they developed a system of sheep wagon where it had hidden compartments all the way down the, the length of the wagon on either side. And you can access those compartments from inside on the bench seats or outside with the doors. So there's two ways to access it. The Wyoming sheep wagon, they usually just had one box on either side of the wagon. And those were only accessible from inside. You could only access it from lifting it up. So there's a little bit of difference there. Uh, but the big difference between a sheep wagon and a prairie schooner was one was for hauling goods and one was for living in. So think of it like an 18-wheeler versus an RV. So basically, like, a normal wagon is for storage? Yeah, a normal wagon is for storage and hauling goods, uh, getting them from one location to another. So like an 18-wheeler bringing groceries to the grocery store, that's your prairie schooner or regular wagon. An RV to go camp in and not have to put up a tent, that's what you're using that sheep wagon for. And then that sleeping wagon is just like a sleeping bag with a, a tent over the top of it. Uh, that way the scorpions and rattlesnakes don't climb into bed with you at night. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank all of you for being here today with us. It's exciting to do this. This is our first virtual school tour. Uh, I think it went fairly well. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Ms. Cisneros, for setting this up. And uh, please, when things find some semblance of normalcy, we want to have you back to the museum to explore. Bring your families with you. And as Stephen said, check out the museum website, rockpilemuseum.com. Thank you. Oh, thank you, you guys. You did great. That was awesome. We appreciate it a lot. You're very well. Very well. Absolutely. So, really quick, Autumn, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. How did you guys get the building at the museum? Great question. Uh, the Archibald family heard it as a donation. Uh, so they went down and they braced up the side of it with some new lumber because it's a little rickety. It's old. And so they braced it up kind of built a box around it. And then they took a, a tractor or a forklift and lifted it up onto a trailer and hauled it into town. Then they, they lifted it down and it, it was originally sitting where the schoolhouse is. And so it was outside for a long time. And one of my projects was to get it inside because I wanted to save it. I wanted people to be able to see it better uh, and to see it all year round. And so we brought it in here and I spent probably three or four days sweeping that thing out. It was um, who knows what I breathed in. Uh, I had a mask and everything, but it didn't matter. But 
Yeah, and so it slid right in through the door here and next to our blacksmith shop. Over here we've got our news record printing shop, uh, a garage, and a saloon down there as well. So this is our annex building and some great exhibits out here if you've never been there. Good question. What do we tell you guys? Thank you.